What recent announcements is Disney now attempting to sweep under the rug? What park rules are still making us scratch our heads? And why are we still seeing prices skyrocketing for upcoming vacations? Today, we're talking about the most ridiculous Disney World changes and how you can still have a great time in the parks no matter what. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. It's about time we discuss the elephant in the room, or rather the elephants. No, Dumbo, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those weird changes that Disney World keeps making inside the parks and why they're even making these changes in the first place. So we're gonna check out some of the most out there decisions being made by Disney recently, while also giving you a heads up for how you can plan around these changes without them throwing off your groove during your next visit. All right, so it's been really quiet in certain parts of the Disney World parks. A little too quiet. Sometimes Disney closes an attraction but doesn't give us a whole lot of heads up as to what's coming next, if anything. So let's talk about all those empty buildings around the parks right now. Take the Voyage of the Little Mermaid stage show, for instance, which used to play throughout the day in Hollywood Studios. Voyage of the Little Mermaid has been sitting idle ever since the 2020 historic closures, but Disney hasn't mentioned if it'll return or if it'll be updated or if it'll be replaced or what's happening with it at all. They're just kind of not talking about it. So for over the past three years, it's just been taking up space as a shell of its former self. But fortunately, the other live action productions in the park, like Indiana Jones' epic stunt spectacular, Beauty and the Beast live on stage, and the Frozen sing-along celebration have returned, giving guests plenty of different shows to experience throughout the day, when they need a break from all the ride lines. And how about the former Stitch's Great Escape building? You remember that one, right? It's over in Tomorrowland in Magic Kingdom, and the show ride thing replaced the traumatizing extra terrestrial attraction the one where Stitch jumped on your shoulders and burped a bean burrito in your face. Yeah, Disney's had a weird way with that building ever since the attraction officially closed in 2018. For a while, it became a Stitch meet and greet. But then back in 2020, we learned that two duplicate permits filed by Walt Disney Imagineering on March 20th were for demoing the interior at the address registered to Stitch's Great Escape. Lots of rumors swarmed around what that could become, but you know, things happened in 2020 that definitely could have impacted whatever Disney originally planned for the area. Alas, today, Stitch's Great Escape is more of a carcass with no word yet on its final fate. But we've still been seeing a lot of movement in the Tomorrowland realm, with the addition of Tron, Light Cycle Run, the new Energy Bites kiosk, and the reimagined Tomorrowland Launch Depot. I know, I know. These new projects still don't answer why Disney is choosing to let those giant empty buildings just sit there with no purpose, but more than likely Disney hasn't forgotten about them. They're just probably wishing that we would as they figure out what to do with them next. Now, as Epcot starts to finally wrap up their multi-year transformation, I can't help but look back on the things that could have been. It's no secret that Disney Imagineers are some of the biggest dreamers around, but sometimes those dreams end up just being that, dreams. Quite a few projects pertaining to the giant Epcot transformation have been changed or even scrapped altogether. For example, what was supposed to be a massive new festival pavilion was rebranded as a festival area to include Communicore Hall and Communicore Plaza. The Mary Poppins-inspired attraction, which would have opened in the United Kingdom Pavilion in Epcot's World Showcase was in development, but later postponed indefinitely. A massive overhaul of Spaceship Earth had been announced, but that project has also been paused for the time being. Wondrous China is another project that Disney has been pretty quiet about since it was first announced. This new Circle Vision 360 film was slated to come to the China Pavilion in Epcot's World Showcase, but we haven't heard a peep about it since. And let's not forget about that ever-elusive Play Pavilion. That was set to be a digital metropolis in the former Wonders of Life Pavilion that's now an Imagineering limbo, even though we did see it on the Epcot Park maps for a while there before it was removed. So that's another big empty building over there. <laughs> in the Disney parks. And that's a weird one too, because I'm sure they're using it for something, like maybe some, you know, administrative conferences or something like that. But it's gotta be weird to be, you know, part of the janitorial crew just sort of cleaning in there. And it's just this big empty dome. Anyway, (laughs) I digress. Project postponements like this don't happen because Disney's mad at us or anything, but in the wake of the COVID-19 closures, Disney had to make a lot of decisions that they didn't necessarily want to make, including cutting back on some of their bigger projects that they had planned. But fortunately, they didn't have to cut everything. Ever since the parks reopened, Epcot has been a vessel for new experiences of all kinds, including fresh experiences like, but not limited to, the brand new Figment meet and greet, Space 220 restaurant, the backwards launch coaster Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure over there in France, the Japan Pavilion's revamped table service, Shiki Sai Sushi Izakaya, the new flagship store Creations Shop, and it's 
Sister Over There, Connections Cafe and Eatery, and even a new swanky looking fountain at the front of the park. Not to mention, we've still got even more things to look forward to. Journey of Water, inspired by Moana, will officially open on October 16th, along with a new Moana meet and greet opportunity nearby. Asha, brand new Disney character from Disney's animated film Wish, which is releasing in theaters this November, will also have a meet and greet location in Epcot soon. Test Track is going to be reimagined for 2024. The Communicore Hall and Communicore Plaza Festival area is opening this December, along with a new Mickey and Friends meet and greet location, and a new nighttime spectacular in honor of the Walt Disney Company's 100 year anniversary called Luminous, the Symphony of Us, will be debuting later this year too on December 5th. As we continue to learn more about Epcot's newest attractions and listen for any word on those currently postponed projects to see if they'll ever decide to become unpostponed, we'll make sure to keep you updated through our latest news videos. And of course, our DFB newsletter, website, social media accounts, so keep an eye out because you never know when some of these shelved projects might be dusted off and brought back to life again. All right, let's talk about the park hopping rules, shall we? Remember the days when you could just hop between parks with reckless abandon? Like, if I wanted to start my day in Epcot to grab breakfast, but catch a skyline or over to Hollywood Studios to ride Rock and Roller Coaster just an hour later, I could do that. Good times. Nowadays, park hopping looks a little different, but those rules just feel silly now. Once again, I got a point toward the 2020 closures to explain why park hopping is much stricter than it used to be. After the parks reopened, Disney set in place that park pass reservation system, which meant guests would have to reserve their spot in the park they wanted to visit each day after buying their theme park tickets. But when park hoppers returned to the scene, the reservation system started working a little differently. Now, when it comes to park hoppers and park pass reservations, you still need to make a reservation for the first park you visit that day, but you can jump over to any other park you want to, just as long as it's 2 p.m. or later. So park hopping in the morning just isn't a thing that you can do anymore. And yet, maybe it will be next year, possibly. Disney recently announced that starting January 9th, 2024, Park Pass reservations will not be needed at all for those who have date-based tickets. In other words, people who buy theme park tickets that are tied to a specific date or set of dates. So that's gonna be most guests who aren't annual pass holders or cast members. You won't need park passes to get into the parks anymore after that date. So what does that mean for the future of park hopping since the 2 p.m. rule just isn't gonna make sense if you don't need a park pass reservation in the first place? More than likely, Disney's gonna fill us in on what the future of park hopping looks like in regards to these new park pass reservation changes, but in the meantime, don't forget about these park hopper rules for the remainder of 2023 because they're still gonna apply to you if you're planning on vacationing super soon. And we haven't talked about this on the channel for a while, but it's definitely a ridiculous change, and that's scrapping the free airport transportation for Disney guests. So Magical Express, AKA the former free transportation service that used to take you from MCO to your resort and back again, has been gone from our lives since the beginning of 2022, and we're still not over it. Shortly after the Magical Express called it quits, that new shuttle transportation system, Mirrors Connect, which is not new, it's literally the same thing, just called something else, swooped in to offer its services to Disney Resort guests who were flying into MCO. Now the Sunshine Flyer shuttles also did the same, giving guests two shuttle services to choose from for a while before the two transportation offerings wound up merging into one mega service, which is now oddly called Mirrors Connect driven by Sunshine. Sorry, a little background for you, but let me tell you why you should care about this. While Mirrors essentially does exactly what Magical Express used to do, you now have to pay to reserve your spot on the bus. Typically, a round-trip ride for an adult will cost you $33.60, and a kid's ticket's gonna cost you $27.30. So, for a family of two adults, two kids, we're looking at an extra expense of $121.80 before tax. Might I remind you, this service used to be free. Now, if you're looking to travel from the airport to your resort and back again, you're gonna have a hard time finding a way out of the airport that ain't gonna put you back over 100 bucks. And that includes ride shares too. Although for a ride share, you'll only have to pay one price for your whole family instead of having to pay for each individual member. Ride share prices tend to fluctuate a lot around the airport, especially during Orlando's peak travel times. So yeah, you could wind up spending only 40-ish bucks, but you could also wind up spending over 75 just for a one-way ride. So even though it kind of puts your stomach in knots knowing that Disney's Magical Express took the free ride along with it, more often than not, mirrors could still end up being your cheapest option, especially if they've got a sale going on, which we saw pop up during the summer. To reserve your seat ahead of your trip, purchase your flight tickets first, then head over to the mirrors website. From there, you'll be prompted to fill out your flight and hotel details, as well as your travel preferences, and then you'll be all set up and ready to go. 
Okay, you knew it was coming. You knew that in a video all about controversial Disney changes, FastPass was gonna have to show up here somewhere, right? But for those of you who aren't as familiar with this major Disney change, let me catch you up real quick. Once upon a time, there was a free line bypassing system called FastPass, then renovated into FastPass Plus, where guests could choose up to three rides ahead of their trip that they wanted to prioritize skipping the lines for. Then after they'd used all three of those FastPasses, they could pick up more FastPasses, one at a time for any rides that still had line skipping availability that day. But in 2020, with the COVID closures, FastPass was pronounced dead, and in 2021, Disney Genie Plus took its place. Much like how the Mirrors Connect replaced Disney's Magical Express, the Lightning Lanes you can select through Genie Plus achieve a similar goal to FastPass. They help guests bypass those giant standby queue lines in exchange for much shorter ones. But today, you have to pay a premium price for each day you use Genie Plus, and those prices fluctuate depending on which park you visit and what day you decide to visit, too. We got a whole video out now detailing why Disney Genie Plus is sticking around for good, but for the sake of today's video, I'm just going to focus on why Disney switched over from a free line skipping service to a premium one in the first place. There's a selfish answer here, as well as a not-so-selfish one. On the one hand, Disney has stated that this switch over from FastPass to Lightning Lanes was to improve the guest experience through managing overall park attendance, and specifically, lines at attractions. But on the other hand, it's no secret that Disney's racking in big bucks for this new service, which is a big help for them since other areas of the company, like the Disney Plus streaming service, have been struggling in the revenue department. The ongoing debate between guests, however, is if this Genie Plus edition was really an improvement or just a a major pricey downgrade. The answer here changes depending on who you ask. Some folks really do like this new service even more than FastPass, since you have the option to stack more lightning lanes throughout the day, meaning you could wind up holding four plus at a single time if you play your cards right. However, other folks have really felt discouraged by this big change, as well as confused by it all, since Genie Plus tends to switch up the rules on how it works all the time. And yeah, that's fair, Disney Genie Plus is overwhelming when you first hear about it. But if you're wanting to use it for your upcoming trip so you don't have to worry about waiting in those ginormous ride lines, we've come up with a free cheat sheet to help you figure out how this system works ahead of your trip so you don't have to feel frustrated or like you're wasting your money on it during your vacation without getting the bang for your buck. Just scan the QR code you see on the screen now or head to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney Genie Plus right after this. Next, we're talking about Epcot's new rideshare drop-off. Now, a relocated rideshare drop-off or pickup point may not seem like a big deal until it's the end of your Epcot day. Before, the rideshare pickup used to be at the front of the parking lot and near the park entrance, but now it's like way out in the boonies over in the Eve parking lot. A little bit of an extra walk in the morning isn't so bad, but when you've been on your feet all day long and still have to walk quite a ways just to make it to your Uber or Lyft, this change becomes a painful one. So why did Epcot make this change in the first place? We're not exactly sure if this is gonna become a permanent location for Epcot's rideshare pickup point or not, but a big reason for this relocation could be because of the returning Epcot parking trams after literal years of them being missing from our lives. These trams can help keep you from making that long trudge out to your car or the new rideshare location, saving your poor aching feet from the extra journey. However, if you'd like a rideshare that'll still pick you up toward the park entrance to avoid walking or tram taking altogether, you might be better off scheduling a ride with one of Disney's minivans. Much like rideshares, minivans provide a direct and private ride from one location to another around property. But unlike other rideshares, they'll only take you around Disney World, and they'll come pick you up and drop you off right at the front of the parks. To schedule a minivan, you'll want to book your trip through the Lyft app by selecting your destination within the Disney World bubble. And when confirming your pickup location, choose select minivan. You may have to swipe through a few rideshare choices if it doesn't pop up as one of the first default options. Minivans are typically pricier than the average ride shares, depending on the day and the distance and the demand, so you'll want to budget back a little extra for them just in case you decide to book one. If you want to skip the extra expense altogether, Disney Resort guests are still more than welcome to take a free shuttle back to their hotel room on property, but if Uber is going to be your way back home off property, then be prepared to tack on some extra steps at the end of the day to make it out to the Eve parking lot. Or wait for one of the prodigal trams to come pick you up if these trams have returned before your next visit. Now, this next one is a pretty personal one, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. The DFB crew and I have been fans of certain Disney World treats for a long time, like a really long time, and we've been such big fans of them, in fact, that we've recommended them on several videos before and in our snack guide ebooks from the DFBstore.com website. But even our favorite snacks aren't immune to the changes that take place in Disney World. Take my beloved carrot cake cookie, for instance. When I first discovered the carrot cake cookie, it was in the former writer's stop location at Hollywood Studios, where 
Baseline Tap House is now. This was way back in the day, y'all, in the early 2000s. And when the writer's stop closed back in 2016, the carrot cake cookie was relocated to Sweet Spells. And when Sweet Spells closed in 2018, the carrot cake cookie took up permanent residence in the Trolley Car Cafe, where it remains. Though now it's called the carrot cake whoopie pie. Now, the carrot cake cookie whoopie pie has never quite been the same since the writer's stop closed. But to be fair, neither have I. But these last few times I've ordered it, I just don't love it like I used to, and I'd much prefer getting a totally different Hollywood Studios dessert sometimes, like the Wookiee Cookie from Backlot Express or maybe a few of the other new options. Now, is it bad? No, it's absolutely not bad. It's still probably one of the best treats you can get in Hollywood Studios, but the cake got a little bit bigger, the frosting got a little bit smaller, and things just got kind of gummy. So is it always not great? No. I still do recommend it to an extent, but just beware. And this one's really heartbreaking. I used to love getting the peanut butter pie at Disney's Contempo Cafe in the Contemporary Resort. I liked it a little less when they had its 50th anniversary makeover in 2021, since it was a lot less peanut buttery and just a lot more not cool. And I thought maybe it'd go back to normal after Disney World's 50th anniversary wrapped up, but it wound up disappearing altogether. Now it's been replaced by the plant-based chocolate peanut butter bar, which is really thick and creamy, but once again, light on the peanut butter, which makes me a little sad inside. However, if I really want to get my peanut butter fix here now, the peanut butter chocolate chunk cookie does a decent job of filling that hole in my heart, I guess, but it's not the same. All of this to say, snacks change in Disney World all the time, and they'll continue to change all the time, and sometimes they can even change for the better, too. But that's why you've got to study up on these snacks that you're looking forward to ahead of time. Make sure you're keeping up with their latest reviews. And that's also why we've got to keep all our ebook snack guides updated constantly so that you can actually study up on these things without worrying that you're getting outdated information in the process. If you'd like to purchase one of our updated snack guides or even a snack guide bundle from dfbstore.com, don't forget to to type in the code YouTube to save money on your purchase. So we're starting to lose hope that we're ever going to see some of these Disney World restaurants again. When Disney World reopened after 2020 closures, the restaurants slowly but surely reopened along with it. At first, some of those menus were very limited and the restaurant experiences had to be modified for the safety of guests and cast members. But today, these restaurants are starting to feel more like their former selves, especially now that character dining is back to normal, breakfast offerings are returning at table service locations, buffets are a thing again, and social distancing is no longer limiting how many guests can be in the dining room. That said, Disney is choosing to keep some of their restaurants closed. This includes two of the restaurants that used to be available over at Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa, 1900 Park Fair and the Garden View Tea Room. Now, 1900 Park Fair used to be a buffet character dining experience where guests could meet characters like Mary Poppins and Alice in Wonderland and several other rarely seen characters around the parks. While Garden View Tea Room was what it sounds like, a lounge that served British style afternoon tea packages daily. So why is Disney choosing to keep these two restaurants closed when most of the other resort restaurants are back up and open for business. Well, to tell you the truth, this change could more than likely stem back even further from before COVID. In 2015, before Bob Chapek became the CEO of the Walt Disney Company, he was the vice president of the Parks and Resorts Division. During this time, Chapek had mentioned that the Grand Floridian was not living up to its flagship deluxe resort standards. Thus, the push for a complete overhaul of this resort started to take place. Since then, we've seen Grand Floridian receive a new Enchanted Rose Lounge, revamp its classy restaurants like Citrico's, Narcoosie's, and Victoria and Albert's, add new Disney Vacation Club villas, update other guest rooms with Mary Poppins theming and high-end decor. So although Disney hasn't released any information on the status of when or if we can expect 1900 Park Fair or the Garden View Tea Room to reopen, I'd say given the historical trend of refurbishments and updates, they'll likely receive a bit of a facelift if they do reopen. Fortunately, all of Grand Floridian's other restaurants, including its more affordable options like Gasparilla Island Grill and Grand Floridian Cafe, are open for any and all guests to dine at right now. And while we're on the subject of abandoned restaurants, we gotta bring it back around to Restaurant Marrakesh and Tangerine Cafe, which both used to be available in the Morocco Pavilion at Epcot. 
Currently, both restaurants are being used for other purposes. Tangerine is frequently transformed into a festival booth with rotating offerings, while Marrakesh is sometimes made into an exclusive lounge area like it is during Epcot's Food and Wine Festival. But more often than not, it's just kind of empty and sad. While it does feel like the Morocco Pavilion is being picked on, it actually comes down to the fact that the pavilion's ownership switched over by the end of 2020, and those restaurants got caught in the crossfire. Before, the Morocco Pavilion was actually owned and operated by an independent operating participant and was also overseen by the Moroccan Embassy and Tourism Board. And although they're still very much part of what happens in the pavilion, ownership has now officially switched over to Disney via a mutual agreement. So what's gonna happen to Morocco next remains a mystery. How However, if you're looking for some authentic Moroccan eats and sweets and drinks aside from the festival items, you can still make reservations over at Morocco's Seoul sit-down restaurant Spice Road Table, or you can grab a pastry and beverage on the go from Oasis Sweets and Sips. Okay, now this next one I hope is going to be resolved very, very soon, but for now it's kind of a bummer. So Epcot puts on four different festivals each year, which is a real big reason why my heart belongs to this park. Throughout these festivals, you'll be able to experience exclusive entertainment and scavenger hunts and limited time merchandise, and of course, so many food booths all around World Showcase, and they're creeping into the rest of Epcot as well. But there's one festival in particular that's been throwing us off for the past few years because it's just not the same anymore, and that's Epcot's International Food and Wine Festival. Brief history lesson for you. The first Epcot Food and Wine Festival was officially held in 1996 when the Walt Disney World Village Wine Festival moved to Epcot and transformed into a smaller wine fest experience. It originated as a way to boost park attendance during the slower season, bridging the gap between summertime and the holidays. During Food and Wine Festival's earlier years, it was much more jazzed up with tons of different food seminars and celebrity chef demonstrations and extra tasting events like Kitchen Carnival and Party for the Senses. But then 2020 came. While Food and Wine Festival still made its appearance in 2020, it was a much, much more condensed version. So there were fewer food booths, no seminars, no specialty guests, no extra parties. But even with the much more limited offerings available, Food and Wine in 2020 ended up lasting longer than it had ever lasted, starting in July and wrapping up at the beginning of November. And that's how it's operated ever since. While Food and Wine continues to provide solid eats and drinks with each passing year, it's just in kind of an awkward growth phase right now. What makes this festival even more strange is that when it kicks off, not all of the food booths open up along with it. Instead, the food booths are kind of chunked up. A few of them are released in July, and then a few more in August, and then the rest in September. While this could very well be a strategy on Epcot's part to continue increasing interest in the park during its slow season, it can be pretty frustrating for guests who visit the festival earlier to miss out on like half the offerings. But let's not forget the festivals are likely going to start looking really different next year, I hope, once the Communicore Hall and Plaza open up. I know I touched on this subject very briefly earlier when we were talking about the Epcot transformation, but just to expand on this topic a little bit, the Communicore Hall and Plaza, once they open later this year, will serve as Epcot's dedicated home base for all the festivals from here on out. While the Communicore Plaza will become an outdoor space set up to host both large-scale concerts and intimate performances alike, the Communicore Hall will be the indoor portion of the fest and able to host a variety of experiences with food, art, live music, and more. But here's where things get really exciting. The hall will also boast a demonstration kitchen, a mixology bar, and an exhibition and gallery space, meaning we just might see the Food & Wine Festival return to its former glory by next year. At least that's my hope. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about our favorite eats from the current Food & Wine Festival going on now, to prepare yourself for either a Food & Wine visit this year or next, be sure to check out our DFB video where we try everything, literally everything, that the Food & Wine Festival has to offer in 2023. Now, we've been singing our woes of the missing Disney Resort perks since the 2020 closures. But even as time passes on, these MIA Disney hotel perks, which used to make your resort stay all the more worthy of your money, are something we're still missing real bad. Some of those former resort perks, I don't have a whole lot of hope that we'll ever see again, like the free Magic Bands for guests, now that Magic Mobile on your My Disney Experience account essentially does the same thing, and the extra Magic Hours, since now Disney's splitting up this benefit into two separate benefits called Early Theme Park Entry and Extended Evening Hours. 
Now, early theme park entry continues to be available for all Disney Resort guests and allows these guests to enter into any of the parks 30 minutes before they open each day. The extended evening hours are just for deluxe resort guests, and it's a couple of hours at night after the parks close, and it's only on very limited nights. That being said, I'm still holding on to a glimmer of hope that just maybe we'll see some resort benefits return in the future, like package delivery, for instance. Before COVID, you could visit Disney theme park shops, buy something, and have it sent directly to your hotel so you wouldn't have to carry around your purchases all day long. But this service hasn't been available since the resort started to reopen. Disneyland's package delivery for their hotels did return this year, so who knows, maybe someday Disney World will follow suit. But I do understand that it's a much bigger operation in Disney World with, you know, 20-something hotels versus three. In the meantime, though, we recommend holding off on making any big park purchases until the end of your day so you don't have to lug your new stuff all around the park. There are also rental lockers available at the front of each park for a daily fee if you want to go ahead and make your gift shop purchases early on and avoid toting them everywhere you go. Now, Disney World is no stranger to change. In fact, tomorrow, some of these changes could be completely null and void. That's how often the parks switch things up on us right now. But that's why we're constantly updating our DFB website and YouTube channel with the latest Disney news to make sure you're never in the dust wondering what on earth has happened to the parks now. And by the way, don't forget to pick up your free Genie cheat sheet over at DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Plus right now so we can send it to your email without missing a beat. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.